We're going to get started again. Okay, moving on to item D of public hearing. Consider any objections by noticed property owners of properties on which a nuisance has been declared to exist, Brisbane Weed, weed Abatement Program. Staff report, please. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Clyde Preston, uh, Inspector with the North County Fire Authority. Um, this item on the agenda is part of our weed abatement program, which we do annually. And what this really is tonight is a legal formality. Uh, these are for uh, property owners that receive certified letters. Uh, our ordinance states that if uh, we deem it a fire hazard and they're not in compliance by the due date, as the City of Brisbane, we have the right to bring a private contractor in have the weeds and flammable vegetation cut from the property, removed, and the cost of that goes to the property owner as a lien for the cost of the contractor and also our administrative fees uh, that we incur in managing that to, to manage to get that program done for their property. So uh, to do that legally, we do have to have the um, open comment period. If anybody who received a letter feels that they're not in violation or disagrees with that, they have the right tonight to come here uh, to, to plead that to you tonight. So as of right now, as of yesterday, we did uh, final reinspections. We have about seven properties uh, that have until tomorrow night uh, to clear their, their lots. And if not, by Monday, we'll go out there and uh, uh, I'll have to have them cleared. But hopefully they've been working on them. We've gotten contact with a few of those people and different correspondence and things like that. So hopefully uh, they'll all be cleared. We won't have to bring our contractor in to do that. So that's the reason for the open hearing tonight. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay. No questions. Any questions? No? Okay. So we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on this item? Tony Varios. First off, I appreciate that um, Clyde noted how many of them there are. Excuse me? Clay. Clay? Clay Preston. I'm sorry. Thank you. Clay Preston uh, noted how many of them there were. As I think that's important, and I'd like to know whether or not there are any hardship cases in there. If there are, then it would be nice for us to be able to work out a way to help those people comply. I imagine that may have already been touched on um, by the fire department, but if it hasn't, I think we should. We shouldn't ignore that. And secondly, I'd like to see the city cut its weeds because we've got uh, right up there on Guadalupe Canyon Parkway right before Mission Blue, there's a very long island that the city controls and planted uh, some vegetation in. And recently a contractor came and cleared the weeds out of about half of it, didn't bother to cut out all the dead plants that died because they weren't watered, and in the second half of it going down the street, there's still four or five foot tall weeds. So I don't appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? Motion to close public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Public hearing is closed. So, um, Clay, is, are there any hardship cases? There's, there's none that I know of, and some of these uh, properties, I, I haven't been able to talk with the people. Some of them I have. Um, one of the things that, that we do, and not, not even before we get to the uh, certified letters, is we do get calls and stuff and things like that. And um, there, there have been cases, there's one actually up on uh, Trinity uh, of, uh, of a resident that did have a hardship case, and one, one of her neighbors when it came in and, and, and cut it for her. But one of the things we try to do is give people different resources. And one of the things we have, we have the, the two or three different city contractors that cut for the city. And um, we have, have them, uh, we don't, of course, we can't endorse or recommend anybody, but we, we give them as a, as a resource to try to do that. But I haven't had anybody come to me and say, I can't afford this from, from the list in the past. A lot of this sometimes is, is just absentee or people who have either moved out of the area or are out of the area who just don't respond. But we really try to make contact with everybody and talk with them to get them to comply just on their own and not having us to go in and do that. But I haven't, I haven't had anybody on the final list that I have that said it's a financial hardship that they can't do it. 
Okay, thank you. Any other clay? <laughs> you want to comment? On I think he he is actually Clyde. His name uh, is Clyde. <laughs> oh, Clyde. Okay. <laughs> you you're right. I'm Clay though. <laughs> One of the other CL guys. I know there's too many CL. Clyde, around Clay, around. Cliff. Mark. Surrounded by them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what so, was your question? Uh, comment about Tony on the weeds up there. Oh uh, well, we'll I'll check into it. Yeah. Okay. Because we do have a contractor that does that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they've been working diligently on right. whacking stuff around town. Yeah. So do we need to make a motion to give direction to enforcement officer to abate the properties that have not complied with the notice? Second. Is it a question, or you were making that? Uh, <laughs> okay. Either way. Okay. Either way. We have a motion. motion. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Motion passes. Moving on to item E, consider introduction of ordinance number 617, zoning text amendment RZ-6-16, municipal code amendments to regulate personal cultivation of medicinal and non-medicinal cannabis and medicinal and non-medicinal non -medicinal cannabis businesses. Uh, yes, thank you, honorable mayor, members of the council. You remember that in June 1st of this year, the council held a public hearing related to uh, proposed code amendments to regulate personal cultivation of medical cannabis and as well as medicinal cannabis businesses. At that time, the council also had a discussion of personal use of uh, cannabis and directed the, the uh, draft ordinance be revised to uh, address uh, non-medical cannabis use as well and related businesses. So I'm just going to walk through some of the uh, proposed changes we've made in, in response to the council direction from the last meeting. Also, there are some other informational items the council had requested, and I'll just briefly touch on those. Um, the overall premise was that in terms of personal cultivation, the council direction was that the um, regulations and performance standards for personal cultivation and um, and for both non-medical and medical cannabis use be uh, made the same. So that relates to the, the uh, you know, indoor, outdoor, the amount of area. The one thing that is difference between um, medical and non-medical would be the number of plants because that is a different standard in state law. So that remains different. But, for, uh, but in terms of where you can have it and the performance standards that are applied, those have been the, made the same. Uh, for ease of um, implementation over time. The other change then was for um, the adoption of regulations and performance standards for medicinal and non-medicinal businesses such as distribution, manufacturing, testing labs. Uh, again, we, we, um, the ordinance as proposed treats them um, non-medical and medical the same in terms of what zones they're permitted in, uh, which zones require conditional uses, et cetera, et cetera. So, so basically, for purposes of the business aspect, we're treating personal and medical the same from a, from a land use uh, regulation standpoint. Uh, again, the uh, ordinance still bans any cannabis retail or dispensaries uh, currently as proposed, and um, there's no restrictions on cannabis deliveries originating from retailers outside the city, into the city, and that was... Um, council policy direction from several meetings ago. Um, another issue that came up was there was a question about the um, trailer bill that was um, incorporated into the uh, the uh, budget this year, or around the budget time. It was a um, change to the state's licensing procedures related to medical and non-medical, and the primary purpose of that was to create a statewide unified licensing system. Um, so the, the, theoretically, that would streamline the procedure at the state level. In terms of the local implications, there, and again, we go through the, on the staff report, page three, there's a listing of the various kind of licenses that the state will be issuing. I think the important thing from our standpoint is that in either case, medical or non-medical, the state uh, is in the position of contacting a local jurisdiction and the local jurisdiction, such as the city, must confirm whether the business is permitted or not. And that would apply to either a non-medical or medical um, cannabis business. 
and cities wishing to regulate or ban cannabis businesses must adopt such regulations prior to the state licensing commencing in January of 2018. So again, you want to affirmatively indicate which businesses you're either prohibiting or permitting and by, by which route they're permitted conditionally or by right or whether you're prohibiting them. So again, that's the value of the ordinance that we're presenting tonight. Uh, there was a question at the last meeting too about uh, whether there are any restrictions on cannabis businesses in proximities to schools or parks or other kind of public facilities. And there is a state established uh, prohibition <coughs> on any uh, cannabis business within 600 feet of a school, daycare, or youth center. That doesn't apply to a park, uh, but it does apply to schools. And again, the, the map on page four of your staff report shows uh, the impact, the, the two schools in town. And as I would show, there are certain businesses, locations on um, Valley Drive and along Park Place and Park Lane that would be within 600 feet of uh, Lipman and therefore would be prohibited from uh, obtaining a, a license from the state for, for those kind of businesses. So there would be locations that are not uh, eligible for such uh, businesses, even if the zoning were to allow them. And we did ahead and go ahead and modify the development standard recommendations to reflect that in our zoning ordinance as well. So you see those proposed standards indicate that that is one of the standards for a permitted use. It has to be more than 600 feet from a school. Um, and lastly, there was a question about cannabis retail and whether um, such a business could be um, prohibit or ban walk-in customers from coming. So you could have basically a delivery business that the point of sale or origination was in Brisbane and the delivery either in or outside of Brisbane. That would still be considered a retail sale, but the, the state does allow um, that the stores, you know, retail delivery can prohibit walk-up uh, service. So it doesn't, because retail, it delivers, but it can be limited to delivery only. It doesn't have to allow for walk-up service. So uh, again, the ordinance before you today or this evening doesn't, it just prohibits retail or dispensary. So that's not, um, you know, on the table at this particular junction. But uh, we did provide that information at the council's request. And lastly, we there was some information uh, that we've kind of elaborated on in terms of Funding opportunities for um, for um, uh, if 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 uh, cannabis related businesses are to be established in the city, and again we're not proposing any uh, uh, additional fees beyond the typical business license fee or other taxes that would accrue. But again, if that's something the council's interested in, in conjunction or separate from this ordinance, you still have the opportunity to direct staff to do more research on a on a funding or fee schedule that might provide more financial benefit to the city. So with that, uh, staff is recommending the introdu introduction of Ordinance 617. And I'd be glad to take any questions you have. Thank you. Questions? No question. I just uh, want to gain more clarity. Um, on page two of the staff report, under discussion, um, the third and fourth bullet points, third bullet point being ban all cannabis retailers in the city, and then fourth bullet point, allow cannabis deliveries originating from retailers outside of the city to occur on city streets. I don't know if I'm just not interpreting this correctly, but I thought that last meeting the council had expressed interest in just hearing more about what that would look like if we did have retailers and how we could you know, put safeguards um, to prevent walk-up traffic and things like that because it sounded like uh, the council was kind of interested in in um, benefiting from sales tax. So we're entertaining the idea of that but wanted more information. So I'm just curious as to how now it's stating, you know, banning retailers altogether, which I feel like we haven't really had that discussion. Sure. Again, the original ordinance did propose the ban. Um, that was what was presented to you last time. The discussion in terms of whether retail could be allowed, I think, got into the question of, of uh, walk-in versus a delivery uh, origination point. And I think as we indicated, 
the state licensing makes it very clear that someone can get a state license as a retailer, but that they're not somehow uh, allowed necessarily to have walk-in. I think that was a question we had with the state licensing, whether if we gave somebody a license or somebody had a license from the state as a retailer, whether they'd be able to, uh, um, that state license would allow walk-in traffic. And it's very clear that that isn't the case. So again, if the, if the city council is interested in pursuing a form of retail that is delivery based only, you know, that's something we could come back with in terms of what the parameters would be, where you'd be interested in those businesses occurring. We'd want to look at the, the performance standards we were applying to any of the cannabis related businesses to make sure they're still appropriate for retail. So we're really not in a position to, to make any recommendations to that particular aspect of the business. If that's the council's direction and you want us to proceed with that, we could still take action on this ordinance tonight and, and come back with the retail component if, you know, if that's the council's direction. Uh, but you know, we could certainly, you establish what the parameters you are that you're interested in and we will uh, make sure that the, the regulations reflect that. Okay, Harry. Um, I sort of remembered the conversation from the last meeting differently, so I went back and reviewed it, and even in our um, city council meetings from the June 1st meeting, or I believe it was June 1st, um, that we did direct the staff to look how we could potentially obtain local revenue and what type of retail op options we had. And I don't think, at least from my perspective, that I came back with this recommendation to ban all cannabis businesses. So um, besides that, uh, I've got a couple, I think, questions on the um, ordinance itself where um, on the personal cultivation um, section 8.12-040 item B so they aren't paid they don't have page numbers so it's it's on the second page of the ordinance itself um, Section 8.12-040, item B, um, item number one, where it says not more than six living plants. That's per household because that's not clear, or is that per, per um, resident or over 21-year-old? It's per dwelling unit. It's not per resident. Okay. <coughs> And then on section 8.12-050, item <clears throat> A1D, so that's the top of the third page, on the exterior cultivation, it only qualifies the fence or a lockable gate when the qualified patient or caregiver is not in the immediate area. And that should be, or an adult over 21. You're correct. We'll make that change. And then on that same section, item six, where we address the convenience of, for the convenience of a qualified patient or primary giver, caregiver or an adult person over 21 years of age, um, that they can come in and um, list themselves as a grower with the city police department. And I think that really, um, while it wouldn't be made public record, I think that it puts us as a city in a um, keeper of medical records for people. And I think that's a violation of privacy and could have some other implications. And I'd like to get the uh, city attorney's um, 
reasoning on, uh, or if that is a reasonable assumption because just like we don't ask for financial information from kids that are on the free lunch program, we try not to have financial or medical information on our residents and I think that that could be a problem. And I think other than that, most of mine are, are more comments after the public hearing on on the rest of the ordinance. Okay. Okay. Do you have any questions? I was going to wait for yeah. the attorney. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't know that item six uh, would have to be included. I don't think that's a state law requirement. I think it was simply put in there as a, uh, you know, as a potential situation so that the police department was aware of what was going on uh, so that if someone, you know, did report there was some sort of a perceived illegal activity, the police department would be able to ascertain that it was not, but I'm not aware that the council is required to have that uh, subsection in there. Would it be, isn't it a risk for the city to be in that keeper of medical private information? Well, again, there's the second sentence does indicate it that the information is not uh, to be considered a public record under the under the Public Records Act, and the city does collect information uh, of a financial nature, for example, whether business licenses uh, that we do not, you know, that is not disclosed to the public uh, either because they're they're covered by confidentiality. So this is a similar a similar kind of situation. It's simply a policy issue in my estimation as to whether or not uh, you want to make that a requirement to re to uh, or a, not a requirement but people can do it but they're not required to do it okay thank you clark did you have any questions i don't have <clears throat> i don't have any questions but uh terry um when you when you were talking about the part of of having retail in Brisbane mm -hmm. you, you said that you thought that um, we agreed to have it no 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 oh. I I think that we did not agree to not have it that we had we had asked for more um, information on the opportunities oh. and the um, if it could be delivery only and not walk up and we could control the visibility and where that went and I think that the staff report addressed that but put it in to the ordinance that we want to prohibit all retail whether it's delivery closed storefront walk up or anything and and that wasn't the direction I was giving and if that and and I think that that was um, noted in the um, minutes from our last meeting that we hadn't I hadn't at least well, that's what I, I think I council member um, Davis had come to that okay we wanted more information and so I was sort of surprised that instead of coming back with more information we also came back with the ordinance banning it and I remember Cliff Cliff's one of what Cliff wanted to know and correct me if I'm wrong Cliff but I'm pretty sure I'm right on this one is that Cliff really was concerned about cash only businesses and so he wanted more information about how what happens with businesses that are cash only businesses and sometimes that leads to questions about security and safety if these are walk up businesses that are known to have large amounts of cash you know what happens with that and so i remember that was one of the things that cliff had wanted more information on and a lot of us had other questions so i think that's why we we never really um, came to a consensus on how we felt about businesses being cannabis businesses, retailers in in Brisbane. Okay, so so the question is then: Are you comfortable with the ordinance the way it's written, or do you want to get that information before we move on it? I'm not. I am personally not comfortable with the ordinance the way it's written. Okay. I'm not comfortable, but I do have the answers to my questions already. Yeah, I have a lot of answers to the questions. I don't need further. I don't need further information, but I do want to make a change to the ordinance. 
Okay. Does staff have anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, that's perfectly within your prerogative. And if you have any questions about the, you know, that, that component, we'll be glad to work through it. But. Thank you. Cliff, did you have questions? Uh, I, I do not. Okay. So <clears throat> let's open the public hearing on this. I do have two slips. The first is Michelle Dietzer. Hi, okay. well, sorry. Hi, honorable members of the city council. Um, still, uh, second time speaking in front of um, the honorable council and Madam Mayor. Um, my name is Michelle Desitzer. Um, I'm founder of Cannabox, and I'm addressing the city council today. Um, I spoke during uh, June 1st, um, June 1st during the, uh, the previous city council meeting on the topic of the cannabis businesses, on topic of cannabis businesses regarding the ordinances. Um, and I wrote a letter um, that unfortunately I only was able to send um, fairly recently. I don't know if um, had the time to read it. I'll cover it quickly. Um, I know time is uh, important. I have kids to get home to too, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, I did want to address some of the questions that um, the council had mentioned. I reviewed the video. I wanted to really address um, the questions you had. Um, I looked into it. I also work with NCIA and um, Cal Normal and San Francisco California Grow Association. So um, regarding some of the questions um, you guys had. So um, one, I'm here to discuss non-storefront delivery um, model. Um, and one reason why I feel this is a really great model for Brisbane is because it is non-storefront and it is completely discreet. There is no um, signage nor people coming um, to to the location, um, nor does the business want people knowing that it's there because of security reasons, nor does the city. Although I'm uh, an advocate for the cannabis industry because I think it needs to change the stigmatism of what it is and education needs to happen um, because it is a movement into the right direction and there's so many medical benefits to it. Um, and if you allow me later, I will quickly explain um, why. Um, I understand that also Brisbane is a really small city and it's a very family oriented city. I myself really want to move here. I live in South San Francisco and I have two kids, a three year old and a seven year old and a family. So I completely understand why Brisbane may not yet want a physical retail location. Um, however, I do think at some point maybe if proven that the cannabis industry can show you that it's it's in its right place and it's moving in the right direction that I think it you know also should be considered. Um, I do think that this delivery model would work also because of taxation reasons. Um, it can other cities like Oakland who have already implemented such models um, like the delivery model have um, charged 1% gross receipts and a delivery model is great because it doesn't only charge what's in the city. A delivery model is we have a span of California. So we may be operating in Brisbane, but our deliveries span across um, more than just what happens in the city. We have deliveries, not me personally, I mean the delivery model because we are a startup, but in general, speaking on behalf of delivery companies, they span across different cities. So the revenue that can be generated by taxes um, are much larger. So the, the amount uh, the city can gain is, is higher and can benefit the community. Um, also, with permitting and from the recreational standpoint, there's the 15% excise tax um, that the city can, can gain. From the banking standpoint, um, a lot of delivery companies deal with um, is mostly done digitally. So now um, from a banking standpoint, everything is moving so quickly. A lot of credit unions are signing up um, cannabis businesses and there are a lot of um, high interest uh, banking online um, platforms that allow for cannabis businesses. Um, I think it's very important to kind of merge uh, the industry in Silicon Valley and, and the cannabis industry and show people that it can be done the right way. There are a lot of dangerous aspects to this business and a lot of dangerous aspects to the cannabis industry, but the goal is to move it the right direction and do it right and secure it the right way and to make sure that this black market is crushed 
and told and showed how not to operate and to show them that we can we can succeed and we need to educate people on how to use cannabis properly and how to regulate it and i think if it's hidden and not talked about it's going to be harder to get rid of um so you know as a parent i am very huge proponent of education and i think it's um very important to do so so um not to take up too much of your time um randy if you wanted to add anything um i will get into uh if uh, you're interested i'd like i brought some examples of cannabis products um if that's okay i asked if it was all right just to show you that it's not all green bags huge um you know uh, large green things. This is uh, a cannabis product. You just come to the microphone. So. Okay. So this is a cannabis product. It is, um, it's to help you sleep. It, there is very, um, it's a one-to-one, -one, which means it's non-psychotropic. It's very little psychotropic. It's mostly CBD based. It has dosing. It's lab tested. It, um, it's a tincture, so you, it's drops. Um, it really helps with um, pain, um, and it has uh, cherry cinnamon, uh, and it's uh, organic, non-GMO, and it um, it's harmless, power relief, and it's it's very different than what most people consider cannabis products are. Um, this company, Kiva, is all about microdosing, so it's really teaching people how not to eat a brownie and just pass out and then go to the hospital. It's trying to explain that, you know, take a little bit, and they're really, they were actually in Forbes magazine about, um, you know, having proper dosing. Um, I think education is key. You know, the more we teach people about what proper medication is, and whether it's recreation or medicine, um, it's still education. So, um, you know, this is a probiotic. Um, it is chocolate, but it's also, again, very, very low dosage, and it is um, medical, but it's, it's, it's a really great product, and it's not as harmful as other medicine. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to show is it's a very different place now than it maybe was a long time ago, and there's a different way to position it, and if we can show people that, then maybe this dark market, this disgusting stigma where kids were a long time ago doesn't have to be where it is now. Um, and then one more maybe I can just demonstrate is Bloom Farms, which donates a meal to every family that kind of buys one. So, you know, it, it's moving into the right direction. As long as we, as we support it the right way, um, it can actually be a very, very positive thing and can have a positive influence. And being that it's already here regardless, um, we want to have a you know, it's it's here. So we can either be part of it or, you know, have a positive influence on it or not. So um, presentation, this is just, uh, you know, how big the market is. It's actually, this is an old slide. It's $50 billion by 2025 now. Um, if you can move next slide. Sorry, I'm way past my time, I bet. Um, this is what dispensaries currently look like. Um, they're not, you know, they're not exactly... Uh, uh, dungeons and hidden things, they're saves, mostly done through transactions. They're not going to be, um, um, they still have cash businesses, but mostly not anymore. They're either done through debit cards and, um, or credit cards done through um, multiple different ways now. Um, there's companies, many, many different companies with strategies on how to do transactions. Um, these are just a few in San Francisco. Um, so this is a few of the companies I was speaking about. Um, Kiva being one of the ones that is spe specializes in microdosing, and so lab testing. Lab testing is on every product, um, and what's crucial is, I think, education about lab testing, telling people what proper lab testing versus not lab testing is, um, really explaining that every product should have results, and it's not just a bag of greens, which is still okay, but even those have results on them and are not just, you know, plants and pesticides and they're, you know, they eliminate all of that. Um, and this is an example of what a delivery business could look for Brisbane. Um, you know, it's a small town, uh, I understand, does not, may, may not want a traditional retail store, although again, I think there is a beautiful location that can look just as nicely in Brisbane. However, 
I'm not pushing my, you know, uh, I'm not pushing, like I said, I completely understand. Um, but again, one to 3% of gross receipts and security, uh, state requires extreme security measures, regardless of uh, city can put even more secure measures on it. Um, there's not a lot of cash in delivery businesses because there's no one bringing you cash. Um, there's no one coming to your store, period. So only the employees that work there. So a um, little bit about me. Um, I'd love to talk to you if you have any questions. A little bit about my business is in the letter. Won't take up any of your time. But if uh, you have questions, I'd love to answer them. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I, 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 well. <laughs> Go ahead. That's OK. All right. Um, OK, so you, your, your business um, is, sure. is more of a, a distributor no, it's it's a delivery. Um, we're a box of the month, so what we do is samples to help people learn what works best with their bodies. Um, we do like kind of like Ipsy Birch Box, um, but we help brands. So we write about the brand and we do samples so people can figure out in small sizes what what it, what reacts with their bodies best. Maybe they don't feel comfortable going to a dispensary right away. Um, small doses, education, we're all about education. Uh -huh. um, and then we do, they could buy, um, if something does work for their body, they could reorder it and buy it. Okay, and you're saying that the market or the industry is moving towards being a non-cash transaction? No, there's always gonna be, I, I can't say that, um, you know, I can't say to that, but it is definitely banking is moving forward, um, moving towards it. Uh, credit unions, there are credit unions that take cannabis businesses. There's still, um, you know, Randy, maybe you wanna speak to that a little bit more, because this is my husband, Randy. Um, we run the business together. He helps on the bank, uh, does more of the banking research. I am a counsel. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of high risk uh, credit uh, processors that offer digital transactions. Um, most dispensaries now at least have that option available. If, in other words, they, they offer to take cash, but in addition to they offer some form of digital payment, whether it be through debit or credit card. With, can I just hop yeah, on please. that question? With your business though, like I'm a, avid user of um, subscription boxes so it's like I think that's actually brilliant what you're doing um, but like they're all online so I've never I can't pay with, for any of my subscription boxes with cash so for your business in particular it would be a fully electronic payment correct, yes. we're, correct. we're looking to for, uh, yeah. for only digital transactions we have a few options that we're looking at okay we have already online we're just looking what's the best one for us but we have a few options already right so it's entirely online? Yes, yeah, completely um, online. And it's different than like the typical type of delivery where there's delivery businesses where, you know, I'm at home and I want it to get delivered to my house like, you know, pizza, right? You just put your delivery and then they come, they bring it to you. And then there's this model where it's more like online shopping, right? So you, you place your order, you get your subscription box and it comes, you know, a certain time every month so that this is a different type of delivery model than what you might be thinking of. Yes, ideally we do want to be able to provide reorders, mm -hmm. but that is not our model right now. But it's not like you're not getting in your car no. and driving no, 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 no. it, no, where no. you where that might be an instance where cash payment could be no, no, accepted. No, no. This Everything is more like online, online shop. Absolutely, there is no cash transaction and actually our everything is done through when we do the drop off of a box everything is done through phone verification id check they have to scan a bar i mean it is like five times checked over so it's not only like we not only, so other delivery companies may just you know hand hand over no we like scan their phone and their id pulls up and then we check the face of the id so we are like extra um maybe because i'm a parent but um we are extra on top of um kind of who we're delivering our boxes to so there are different the point is there are different kind of types within the delivery realm there are different kind of types of yeah. ways that that can function yeah is what i you know all right so your your type of business would be in the industrial park yeah yeah, I it would no that. sign, and um, we were even discussing. So, like, we wouldn't even register our business. Yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want even, people to know where our business no. is. So, and for us, in terms of the type of space that, for example, any delivery business, not only just our business, could use, the industrial park is fine for that kind of space because, again, it provides easy access in terms of roads, 
uh, for you know for 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 the for delivery the of a to, box or, or monthly yeah, or box kind of delivery, delivery. Um, and as well as uh, you know there's there's no need for that retail there's no need for that foot traffic retail component and no need for signage for and it's a tech company. we're we're also a tech company so uh, you know we have five employees on a computer okay so you, you would you consider yourself a wholesaler or a retailer retailer, retailer. so you would be a retailer okay Thanks. So I have a question sure. um, about the the tax revenue. Sure. So you mentioned that um, even though it's not a you know on-site um, walk-in service, it's a delivery model. You said that there would still be a tax benefit to to a city. So as and you said it would come through an two different methods. You said there was you know the regular sales tax and then also an excise tax. So did our I'd like to hear from our our city staff on the the tax implications of allowing this sort of delivery service in our city because my understanding from John's talk earlier was that the city that the revenue wouldn't be there unless it was on site so can you can you clear that up a little bit or maybe Stuart well the only thing I, I'm to my understanding the excise tax is not something that goes to the city that's my understanding and any retail that's and Stuart can speak to this, I assume a point of sale, whether it's walk-in or delivery, uh, I assume then the city would uh, defer to Stuart on that question. Um, for the sales tax, the, the question would be is where they would, where they would, where they would claim the sale takes place. So if they are claiming the sales takes place within Brisbane, then we would be able to get the CITUS sales tax. Um, if they have control of the product and the and that product is being delivered out of Brisbane, that would you know, that would make a lot of sense as to why the sale takes place within Brisbane. Uh, you know, a lot of times you think about it like a um, Walmart.com where we where they did all the computer work in Brisbane, all their staff was in Brisbane, but their product was controlled not by Walmart, and this is the interesting aspect of it, but was controlled by third-party delivery services. So therefore, the sale took place at the point of delivery, not through Walmart.com. So if, they, if, if all aspects of the business take place within Brisbane, then Brisbane would be the location for the 1% Bradley Burns. Um, additionally, there, of course, would be um, the business license, gross receipts tax, and then, you know, if the city council and the community desired, you know, there'd be an ability, you know, as with all business license taxes, you can carve out different types of businesses for different business license taxes. Okay. But the excise tax is, the 15% excise tax is truly the state's money. And, and Stuart, uh, you know, based upon that, that explanation of, of how you would receive the sales tax money, we couldn't create in our own ordinance how they structure where the sales tax would uh, be generated from. No, I mean, that's determined by the Board of Equalization, but a lot of it also has to do with the business itself. I mean, one of the conversations you know the difference with the walmart.com was where they where walmart considered the sale taking place the terms of their agreement was the sale took place at the location that the product was delivered right. as opposed to where the order was taken yeah and so that that's my point so could the city require we could, we, we could. the point of sale be here rather than where it was delivered I'm going to look to Michael and to how that works. Yeah. I mean, I have a business and I, I sell stuff to lots of different cities, but I generate the sales out of here. So I, I'm assuming that all the sales, tra sales tax that I generate is benefiting Brisbane. Right. When you fill out your forms, you say that your, your, the, site, the site of the sale is within Brisbane. So yes, we do receive that. I know when you had the other business, you know, Red Dog, I know that that was a one of our sales tax producers yes certainly we would you know uh, we could we could indicate in the ordinance that that would be the point of sale the the issue though would I mean that would not necessarily be definitive and 
other jurisdictions could claim uh, or the, that, it, that it was not, and it might end up going to the county pool or mm -hmm. at the point of delivery. I mean, we would not be the final determination. We would not make the final determination on that, but we could indicate in the ordinance that for purposes of sales tax that delivery or the, the, the sales would be uh, considered in, in Brisbane. We could write that into the ordinance. Okay, good. Thank you. Good point. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions for these speakers? No, but it was good. I mean, you know, to get a kind of understanding of a potential business and what that might mean. So thank thanks. you. I, I have a question for uh, Commander Meisner. <clears throat> Bob, what's uh, what's what's a uh, uh, law enforcement's view on uh, businesses that was described of uh, delivery service? D is there one or is there like a differential from a retail delivery to a retail walk-up uh, type business? You know, th these type of things are, are really, you know, quality of life issues in terms of what businesses you want to bring in and kind of the atmosphere. I mean, we only, we only re-speak to what the potential hazards or increase in crime could be, you know, depending on what you guys propose. Um, so I, I think we'd want to have a better definition of what that would be in terms if you are going to want some type of retail, whether it's restrictive to, you know, non-walk-up or walk-up. And, and once we get an idea of what that is, we could come back to you with some comments and recommendations in order to uh, give our best effort to ensure that we're, we're addressing the safety and crime issues associated with those types of businesses. Mm -hmm. We do have another slip. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, Freddie Domingo. Hi, hey, Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, so, I came here today and, you know, I wasn't really sure. Could you, could like, you move a little closer to the mic? Please? So, I wasn't really sure about, like, you know, like you guys, when I read the ordinance, it says, like, you guys completely ban retail. And I wasn't really sure if I should, you know, come here and talk to you guys about you know the retail aspect of cannabis um, so let me introduce myself again um, my name is Freddie and we have a small business here in uh, Brisbane uh, it's called Navadeal uh, we're an inter international company uh, we have offices around the globe uh, London Philippines China uh, Japan and here in San Francisco um, we do e-commerce business um, uh, we do um, import export and various other um, you know businesses and we saw the potential of cannabis business and this is something we would love to invest in and I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, opening up a retail store here in Brisbane um, I mean the revenue is you know the main aspect of like why we are here talking about cannabis tonight and you know um, the business model that we have for the retail is something much more different from the delivery service that they were talking about uh, we wanted to be transparent with you guys and you know having like an actual retail here would be beneficial for the city because you guys would get all the tax revenue and uh, we're going to have like a much more um, transparent uh, system where uh, like what they've talked about, like more of a, um, a card based, like, a, you know, service, like rather than cash based um, thing. So we would eliminate like, you know, cash based um, transactions. So everything would be uh, credit cards or um, online payment. Uh, and also it would you know like the traffic would uh, ben like Brisbane would uh, benefit from like the amount of traffic that we could like bring into the city um, and I know like the safety like I mean <coughs> the community is probably like really <coughs> about safety and one thing that we wanted to really do is like um, you know like do you want Walmart here or do you want a Whole Foods so, I mean, it depends on, like, really, like, the type of retail that we're going to bring in here. 
if we want to focus on like the high end customer, then we could pull those like high end customer to come here rather than like, you know, like Walmart customer. So, you know, we want those whole food customer to come here and spend their money here in Brisbane and also have the other uh, businesses um, benefit from this uh, traffic. Because if you're bringing in like all this foot traffic here in Brisbane, then other businesses would also try from this traffic. Because they're gonna see like, oh, there's a restaurant here, why don't we go try this restaurant here? Or there's a shop here, let's go shop there. So. <laughs> don't be nervous, you're doing a great yeah, job. A little you're okay, it's okay. Yeah. It's really important, you know, I know that this is a really, um, is this kind of, there's a stigma around cannabis. It's very controversial and oftentimes it can be difficult to come and to talk about something that it may not be so mainstream yet. And so it takes a lot of courage to talk about what you, what you want to do and, you know, hope that somebody doesn't judge you or, you know, have an idea about who you are because of the industry that you're in and, you know, I really just want to applaud you for coming and talking to us. And it's really important for the council to to understand what these business owners are like and that really cannabis is an industry that affects all walks of life, you know, not just a, a bum on a street, right? And that's really, I think, what a lot of people have in their mind about who uses cannabis. So I think it's you know, you really should pat yourself on the back, and you know, I really appreciate you coming and talking to us. Don't be nervous; it's okay. Thank you. You should, you're free to say, you know, the anything other thing, you want. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing that we also wanted to do is like, um, so it is going to be a walk-up business, but we also wanted to open like more of like a cafe, and you know, like uh, because there's a lot of business in the like, especially CBD products, where they uh, fuse those to like, you know coffee or food so we wanted to like bring in those really high-end customer <coughs> to come here and enjoy <coughs> you know have a uh, cup of coffee or you know eat something with like CBD products and... thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay all right um... So moving on is, yes, Tony Barrios? Yes, I was going to ask for more pu public comment. Thank you. I liked what that gentleman said about high-end customers. Uh, he may not have expressed it the way I would, but I'd say high-end customers. There are right now two applications. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of it. You probably are, at least maybe a couple of you may be aware that there are at least two applications for retail marijuana outlets on Leland Avenue, which is not very far from here, which would draw customers from here right now. And uh, uh, some of the neighbors up there in that neighborhood are very adamantly against it because they're paranoid. They already have a high crime rate in, in Visitation Valley, and they don't want it to get worse. But they don't realize that this business, just like a, a liquor store or a Safeway that sells liquor, isn't necessarily going to create more crime for them. Um, I don't use these products myself, but I know other people who do. And uh, as some of you may also know, it's not... Um, it's just not all about getting high, although there's no way at this point to tell how many people just use it recreationally and to what extent. But uh, I think that Commander Meisner would tell you that anybody that uses any of these products, if they overuse them, they get stopped driving, they're going to get a DUI or whatever the proper designation is. So that would seem to be... Uh, uh, something that would be cautionary for anybody who's using these products just like any other prescription drugs or alcohol you have to use them responsibly and uh, I don't understand what the paranoia is about walk-up traffic because uh, from my understanding what I heard here tonight the 600 
uh, what John Swicky said, 600 feet limitation from the schools, if you draw a circle on a map, wipes out most of the area where residences are in this town and a lot of uh, a certain part of Crocker Park as well. So if, uh, if a retail establishment fit in someplace outside of that 600 uh, foot ring, it would seem like that would not uh, be a big problem. I don't understand what the problem would be. The, uh, the one place in particular that I'm familiar with now is called Apothecarium on Market Street across from a Safeway in San Francisco. And every time I've been over there giving somebody a ride to go in there and purchase med medical marijuana products, um, you don't see lines outside the place. You don't see crime. And I'd like to hear from Commander Meisner again about what crime he's heard of because I haven't heard of any in San Francisco where they have numerous uh, medical marijuana outlets already. And you would think that with the product that they carry that they would be a big target for burglaries or robberies, holdups. We don't see that happening and that may reflect the level of security that they have in there. So I would just suggest to you that we not be paranoid about walk up and just let it go and treat it like you would treat the liquor store at Julie's Deli or any place else in town. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who'd like to comment on this item? Seeing no hands. Bring it back. Motion up. to close public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Public hearing is closed. Council discussion. So, uh, I guess uh, to Tony's point, I I know some crime that happened in San Jose. I think it was last year or year before last, Bob. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it, some of these places have been robbed and walk up uh, medical marijuana places. Yeah, I think that was some of the reasons driving their um, reorganization on how they. Um, permitted those business businesses was a result of the high crime rate in the areas of those dispensaries, maybe not at the dispensary itself, but just the amount of crime that are brought to the areas and neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I tell you, I'm not, uh, um, for me, I'm not really ready at this point to do it. You know, I think it's relatively new industry, and uh, I'd like more data from outside, from other communities, to see exactly what happens. You know, before I say, yeah, I would, <clears throat> I would have a dispensary. That's just me. And uh, a retail? You mean a, a walk-up kind of dispensary? Dispensary yeah. period. Mm. Okay. Even. You know, I'm I'm just not ready to go there. I mean, I, I appreciate you folks. You know. Uh, um, coming forth and and showing us how you know what you deal with on the internet and, and you give us your testimony and everybody but uh, for me I'm, I'm not comfortable to go there just yet and you know I, I would need more real life uh, what would you say because we are a small town and you know I don't want to all of a sudden being like oh sheesh you know, we're overtaxing the police department. All of a sudden, this becomes a focal, a focal point, and you know, it, it becomes problematic. I, you know, I just don't know enough to to say. Yeah, that sounds great. You know, this is a, uh, you know. So I mean, f further on in the agenda, we got electronic billboard. You know, and a lot of people are up in arms about, you know, uh, light noise. You know, and this is, you know could be altering and, you know, folks uh, certainly misuse things, you know, to do their lifetime. So I, I just am a little bit concerned about doing this right now, but moving forward with the dispensary. This, this, me as one-fifth of this council, that if that's the direction the whole council wants to go, uh, I'm going to leave me out of it. <laughs> so, Carrie? So I was up in Washington State 
and went to a lovely little town called Bainbridge on Bainbridge Island, a very hoity-toity, um, upscale place. And I went in one of their new medical marijuana dispensaries there. And it's like, and it's not, I shouldn't say medical marijuana, it's a, a recreational marijuana. And it was like going into one of the nicest bookstores you've ever been in, where people came in, they looked, you know, they shopped, they may have been more curious than anything else, but it was one of the loveliest tea shops kind of places. It was like going and looking at art and jewelry with the array of products and what they had. And it was daylighted. It wasn't hidden in the back room. It wasn't a dark thing. It was something where it was everything from, you know, 20 somethings to 60 or 70 year olds coming in, looking, shopping, and having an experience. And it was very interesting to see it brought out. And it's the difference between going to, yes, there's a seedy little bar that you may not want to go in, and then there's the upscale, high-class cocktail lounge that is a whole different thing. And I think that by trying to, we know med, uh, recreational cannabis is coming and it's gonna be legal. And how we deal with it and daylight it makes a big difference. And I wouldn't personally, I can see being cautious on the retail walk up if people aren't comfortable with it and that it might, I don't think we're probably big enough for that anyway, a big enough draw. But as far as having a retail presence that is delivery only, I think it is fine. I, don't, I think that there's many businesses in Crocker Park that deliver something that none of us would ever know what they're delivering. And whether it's medical marijuana or, you know, T-shirts, um, you wouldn't know. Sex, and it, Sex toys. We had or sex <laughs> toys. You just yeah, wouldn't had know. Have business here. To, you know. Really? I didn't know that. See? I, <laughs> I didn't know that. So I, I think that we're putting fear in generator. with this ordinance. And I would rather not shut the door on the opportunities that exist. And I think that just like making Brisbane a dry county, if we were to say, oh, no more alcohol sales, people are going to get it somewhere else to use it here. Um, and if it's legal, I don't think that we should be hiding it in the back rooms and, and pretending that this product doesn't exist here in Brisbane. I think we should take advantage of the opportunities. And if we are going to um, be worried about it, maybe go part way with only delivery. But even that, I think that within the parameters that the state is setting, that they are doing a really good job of, of making sure that there's security there and that they're keeping it away from schools and keeping it where it's manageable. So that's my two cents. Yeah. I have a question for, for staff. So um, in regards to that, that, that radius, the 600 feet radius, so if, um, If, you know, we have this established school here, established school here, and there's a daycare here and one there. And then a couple years down the line, you know, well, we allow this uh, business to occur in a certain part of the industrial park, but then someone comes in and puts a daycare center. And now it's within the 600 feet. So how do you deal with that? It would be a it would be a legal non-conforming use, and so if if the use was in there before the other use that came in that rendered it non-conforming, uh, the use could continue there. It just would not be able to expand, or if it went out of uh, business for a certain period of time, it couldn't resurrect itself, as it were. Okay. All right. 
Um, you know, I, I'm I'm fine with with moving forward with some retail component. Um, you know, I have concerns about the cash thing. So if we were going to do some kind of retail, I, I, I'd want it to be uh, non-cash transactions. Um, can we do that? So but can we can we mandate that? So can we limit it to online sales, Michael? That, that that's one of my questions for you. Oh uh, well, you mean credit card? Well, well, not every. The difficulty is not not. I mean, I mean if it was online, not everybody would necessarily would time. have a computer or a, or a uh, or or a credit card necessarily. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I'm just trying to think of how it would work practically. Um, they, they if you can't, if your people that. aren't walking up. Uh, but if there was a retail establishment like walk up, walk up traffic, can you mandate that they can only take payment via credit card or debit card? Well, I want to say that I think I think certain businesses do say that, but I'm I, I can't point to that. But I know I mean I can recall that that there are, I mean I can recall people saying that we only take you know credit cards, and if you don't have a credit card, you don't get to do the transaction. Like but on I the airplane, I can't point to something, but I I I believe I've seen that happen. Because I see it cash, you see it cash right. all the time. But what I'm asking is like, can you require a business? Like I don't. I don't think that you can. I don't think you can require a business. If it's online a delivery, that's different. But if it was a walk-up traffic, I don't think you can require a business to take only credit cards, right? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that as I sit here. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm fine with, like, taking some, some small steps. I know that you're not there, there Clark. Um, but it is, it is something that, that, you know, is going to be legal. And so, um, you know, we should uh, try and, uh, I think, provide the right structure that provides safety. And, and you know, we take the guidance from, from uh, the police department. Um, but I do have, you know, concerns about the cash. And so maybe a year from now or two years from now, whatever, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't um, amend the ordinance and, and allow for those things. Um, so, but I, I would be fine with some kind of business model. I mean, I'm glad that you, you made that presentation because that that showed me, okay, yeah, I, I'm, I wasn't thinking of the other products. Um, so I, I, I'm good with, with, with that. Um, the other items, I mean, I, I, I do think there are some loopholes in regards to, you know, growing it in someone's home, but uh, I think uh, people will just find a way to, to get around the system there. So I, I'm, I'm good with those other things. So um, I'm, I'm good with the ordinance, but with having the limited retail be, be online at this time. Okay. Madison, did you have a chance to? No, I, not yet. Okay. Um, so I just want to address a couple of things that have been brought up. Uh, we've been talking about marijuana since basically I got on the council. And, um, you know, we really haven't had people coming to our meetings or writing to us telling us that they don't want this business in Brisbane. And as Clark mentioned, you know, we're just talking about a billboard, an electronic billboard, and we immediately get a couple letters about that. So I think for the amount of time we've really been discussing this, everyone wants to talk about how there's all these safety concerns and it's very controversial, but I think we would have heard it from our constituents by now having talked about this at length. In fact, we've heard from many people in our community who have come and spoken and who have said that they are open to this kind of business, which I think is, as I mentioned earlier, um, maybe difficult to come and say for fear of judgment. Um, so, you know, I, I think that if anything, from what I've seen from our community, there's more embracing of this. Um, than we're really giving our community credit for. And 
I respect where Clark's coming from, but I would argue that there is a lot of data. I mean, look at Colorado, look at Washington, look at medical marijuana. We have lots of data on these businesses because they have existed for a while. Delivery businesses have existed for a while. Um, also, when you think about the type of establishments that they are, uh, like Terry, I've been to a few myself, so I can speak to uh, the quality of what these businesses are like. They're actually <laughs> kind of will blow you away. And I really think that that happens because there's such a strong demand once there, once access is given that if you have a storefront that's really... Um, that's not that great, people won't frequent it because there are so many other options. You think about, you know, baby boomers that have uh, extra disposable income or millennials, they are looking for a nice experience. And I, I think that, that those would be the customers that would come. So to me, you know, I'm really, I'm open to this. I think delivery is a no-brainer, absolutely no-brainer. I don't agree with any of the arguments about safety. It is completely discreet. You don't know that it's there. Um, it's all the transactions are online. I think that we would be fools to miss out on that type of revenue, especially for something like Cannabox, right, which could be a huge business. I order from a, a subscription box called Pop Sugar. They send out thousands of boxes a month. They're actually based in San Francisco. And imagine if we could attract a business like that, um, that we could get revenue from for deliveries that are made all across California. That's, that's amazing. We talk about wanting to move away from sales tax and from, from or we, we talk about moving, wanting to move away from um, generating revenue from like soils processing and the dump and things like that, recology. And these are really opportunities that we have to start transitioning and start finding other ways that we can really generate revenue for the city um, that that we can rely on long term, that we can be proud of. So for me, I would hope that you guys would support a delivery type business. I know that it's a big ask for a walk up establishment and I completely understand that. But you have to understand, think about Madhouse. We take tons of cash. There's a bank in town. They're full of cash robberies happen everywhere. It doesn't matter. And if you think about like that type of business, if you go to a dispensary, there's somebody outside a security guard armed. So, I mean, they're really kind of locked down. Um, but there are plenty of businesses that have lots and lots and lots of cash and they get robbed too, just like everybody else. So I think to just operate on a fear factor really prevents us from taking advantage of a great opportunity. And we want to be a city that is welcoming to businesses. We talk about that all the time. We want to open our arms and really attract businesses to come here. We want to be a destination for people who are, are smart and doing innovative things. And I think this is an opportunity for us to really live out that mission and, and really put put our money where, th where our mouth is essentially and actually do what we say we're going to do. So, you know, if we want to say we are a biz we're a, um, a city that likes to attract business and has a welcoming business community, this is the perfect way. I would love to welcome, you know, we already have somebody who's in our business community and I would love to welcome another. So I'm sorry for that long winded explanation, <laughs> but I really just had a lot to get out and I didn't want to forget anything. Yeah, you know, I just I just want to comment on that. I mean, I, I'm glad that you know you're very supportive and passionate about it. You know, we did have someone come before the council when we were dealing with medical marijuana, and he talked about you know a negative side of of that, and and because oh, Blue Scott, said, I do remember right, that. We 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 then modified what we were originally going to propose. Yes. So there, I mean, there has been, so it isn't like I was talking about. Anybody. I was talking about retailers. Okay. So yes, that that you're correct about that. I was thinking about retailers. Yeah, and you know. Um, Nobody wants to grow you know, house. Uh, 
uh, you know, cannabis that is, um, you know, non-medical, you know, we're, we're going into new, new territory. So, I mean, it's like we don't have, you know, any, like, real good track record. We do know that, that because of the, you know, a lot of the taxation that's occurred in the states that have made it legal, now there's, a, you know, a, a very um, robust black market. And so we're going to be trying to, to, to I think, as a, as a society, you know, working through that. Again, I, I, I'm in support of, of, you know, doing the retail online, you know, and having it, say, be in the industrial park. You know, I'm good with that. I, right now, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we take those smaller steps. I'm not as aggressive as you are with, with, with cannabis. But again, I appreciate your position, but, <coughs> you know, if, if we can move forward with this, uh, where the transactions are online, out in the industrial park, um, then, then, then I'm cool with it. Okay. So um, it's been a great discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of on the same along the same lines as um, Cliff and I think Clark as well. You know, I'm okay with the with the industrial park uh, with the um, delivery service, um, but I, I I'm not comfortable with the um, idea of having storefronts in Brisbane. To me, this seems very similar to, um, you know, e-cigarettes and vape shops. You know, that was a policy decision that we made that we don't want those types of establishments in our city because of the potential impact on our youth and, um, you know, our young adults with addiction issues and uh, with lung cancer risks. And, and those, those are the, some of the similar risks here. Um, you know, maybe there may be some other delivery models, but um, smoking is also one of the ways that people can can take cannabis. And you know, being married to an oncologist, I'm I'm very sensitive to the cancer risks. Um, so, I I you know I'm I'm glad that we have you know this radius around our schools that pretty much rules out most of the residential section anyway. Um, but I I think I, I'm feel more comfortable going slowly into this. And just because there's revenue out there doesn't mean we have to go for it. You know, I wouldn't go for the e-cigarette revenue. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's not, um, it's not something that I want, you know, all the kids in town to start, to start doing. So I, I feel, you know, I want, I want to protect the youth in our town and I'm okay with the dispensary model or the, um, the delivery service, excuse me, um, but, but not the storefronts. Um, because of the safety um, as well as the impact on our youth. So um, the way it's worded right now, um, does everybody feel comfortable with that? So well, it, doesn't it say that it bans all retailers? So no. It bans all no, retailers. No, we're going we're gonna to make a change to it. Well, she said, are you comfortable with the way it's written okay. right so now? So can we, so well, what, okay. what's the All city right. attorney's advice yeah. on if we want to Yeah, it, it seems to me that, that maybe the safer course of action is to uh, introduce the ordinance as it's written tonight. Uh, I think you've provided direction to Absolutely. staff with respect to uh, amendments that <laughs> would allow for the, um, the uh, dispensary slash delivery model but I think as the planning director has indicated that, that you should give staff some time to uh, come up with some performance standards for that and then uh, because it would probably be another amendment to the zoning ordinance, we would have to run that back through the planning commission and back to the council. But this way, this ordinance would get in place. Uh, if it's introduced tonight, the second reading won't be until September, won't take effect until October. Uh, and our concern is that we need to get uh, certain regulations in place before the state issues the license and the concern would be if we delay uh, delay this to go back and do the performance standards we're going to be running up against a very tight deadline with respect to the end of the year so I think the staff's recommendation would be to if the council is comfortable with as the ordinance has written introduce it tonight uh, you provided the direction to staff with respect to the uh, dispensary uh, delivery model and get that back to the commission and the council as soon as practical. 
Okay. So, so I'm, I'm sort of confused on, on how that works to introduce the ordinance where we're banning medical or retail sales when we're considering retail non walk up customer um, ordinance at this point. Can't we introduce it as amended? To include, in, to include uh, non storefront uh, retail. After further review and uh, discussion with the planning director, I, I believe that uh, we would be comfortable if the uh, if the council wants to introduce it tonight with the. Uh, amendment concerning the delivery um, dispensary model and we would then bring back the final language as it were or the the, the language for the second reading uh, and make sure that was consistent with what the council's direction was tonight okay so I'll okay. make the motion to Can I through, through the chair before you do that I just want to make sure we're clear on the amendment we'll create a new land use category of delivery only retail or something there'll be a new definition so that'll be a new use um, right now all the cannabis related businesses in crocker park are permitted by conditional use permit so we would add this new business um, delivery uh, cannabis delivery whatever we call it do you want that by use permit or do you want to allow it by right what's your what's uh, all the rest of the cannabis businesses in that zone right now are, are by use permit, but I want to make sure that we're makes sense, then. clear on what your desire is. I would say what okay. I don't think I have a problem with it as, as being by use permit that, you know, we. Okay, and, and then um, in regards to having it be um, delivery service, Only. that also is and then that also would indicate that the sales would be done online. Well, I would think we the benefit of a use permit is we could, um, when an actual application comes forward, you know, whether or not you make that. Again, I'm, it's one thing to, if you want to put that in the, as a standard or requirement, you can. It gets probably at the end of the day very difficult to implement, but a use permit would be business specific. So if business model, like, like okay. some of the models you heard tonight, that would be part of a use permit application. The city would understand how the business actually works and if that, somehow affects the city's decision making in terms of you know this kind of business model although it's permitted by you know it's technically eligible for a use permit if the city's not comfortable with the business model for whatever reason the use permit gives the city discretion okay uh, I, you know i mean i that's something that if i'll let you guys work it out um and then we also talked about the uh, sales tax right, right? Well, wait, wait a minute i mean let let them figure out about the use permit I mean, that's the direction that. In, in regards to the Do you have a, an process. opinion on that? Oh, huh? Are you okay with it being a by use permit? No, I'm, I'm going to vote against it anyway, but I, I think it should be a use permit if you're going to do it. That's what we that, said, that yes. Mm -hmm. We did. I just, we did. Okay. I just don't know necessarily. Like, I know you have really big concerns about cash, but some businesses like Cannabox, that would be entirely credit and debit card purchases but other traditional delivery models are like pizza right so sometimes you might pay over the phone with your card or you might buy it through eat eat 24 whatever i, I hear it and if some you wanna, I, I you know if you want to get my you know, approval on this thing I'll, i just don't know that you I, can I, force I wanna, someone i already said I, i've already said it like twice i just don't so, can we do that well i think i think you don't have to get into the into the nuances tonight because if you're going to make it a conditional use permit those kinds of decisions about online versus cash etc can be whether it's going to be put a condition that it will be uh, point of sale in brisbane etc can be made conditions of approval and doesn't necessarily have to be embedded in the, in the ordinance itself right point of sale but can you force a business to use only to only accept credit and debit, can you do that? Well, I think we were having a discussion about the the delivery system, whether or not you could do it that way. And 
I don't think we have a definitive answer for you tonight, but I don't think we have to provide that because I think if we get an application and depending on what that business model is, we can then determine whether or not we can limit it or not. I don't think we have to decide whether that is going to be a condition or not of a particular business model. Someone comes in and says, I'm only going to do online. We don't have to decide the issue. And if somebody comes in and says, I need both, then we can decide whether or not we can require it to be only online. We don't have to decide that tonight. Okay, so a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. I'm fine with that. I'm totally open to compromising. I just know that, you know, what's kind of been thrown out is that there's a hesitance to move forward with walk-up retail because we don't know what is going to happen in that space. And I, I think that's fair. Cliff did say that, hey, maybe in two years we'll be willing to look at this issue again. I would ask that, you know, if we can move forward with a baby step now with delivery, great. I would totally support that, but I would ask if the council would be open to re-looking at this issue in two years when we do have more data and really um, look at it again if this is the right fit for us when we have more data to go off of. I know. I, you know, it's like any council member. If you want to bring something before the council, if it's important to you, then 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 you do that. So, and just through the mayor for one more point of clarification, that it's only in the Crocker Park zone that you want to do this, or you want this in? Because what about here? again, through the rest of the ordinance, when it came to cannabis-related businesses, there's some like Southwest Bayshore. There's Sierra Point, but for this retail or this delivery service, you want to leave it only to TV perhaps one? we exclude residential area. Exactly. If we just l exclude, well, there's, there's no there's no retail uses permitted in residential zones. Well, so, I think that right. if we exclude it in residential areas, that so you want to allow it in any other commercial or industrial zones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. And Michael, earlier you said that we could include in the ordinance that all sales are considered to be in Brisbane. Well, I think I think that would make more sense to have it as part of the conditional use permit conditions. Okay. Rather than um, rather than be, because that that really isn't necessarily a land use thing. It really seems like it's more uh, particular as to the uh, as to the use. So I think that would be the appropriate uh, place to place that. Okay. okay. All right, very good. So All right, so I think you got that. That's, that's my, my motion. So, okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, opposed. Okay. Be the curmudgeon tonight. Okay. So and, uh, note that uh, council member Bob, Conway uh, Now that opposed. you know what that is, can you get information on that type, <laughs> please? Okay. So. I don't know with the time, like, how much of the rest of the items we're going to make it to. Yeah, that's why uh, what needs to be done. So um, you have a member of your Parks Commission in here tonight on item D. Um, item A is um, time sensitive and item F is time sensitive. All right. Otherwise, you can postpone the other items. Uh, I will. I do want to say that with regards to item B, we had um, at your direction uh, attempted to separate out the city issue on minimum wage from the uh, commercial uh, issue on minimum wage and that's scheduled to come on September 7th so if you don't deal with it tonight they'll both be on the same agenda they're two different issues I and think hopefully we can compartmentalize yeah. them but I just want to point okay. that out yeah I think we should deal with the time sensitive issues. <coughs> okay so we're gonna skip items B and C is there anything else and G and G and H. H and G and H. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing? So we're going now to item A. We can do A and, and D if you'd like to do D first since we have a member of the audience it's Sure. That. Yeah. Okay. Item D consider approval of the public art implement implementation guidelines. That report, please. Sure. This has been um, based on the fact that you approved the public art ordinance in 2014. You directed the Parks and Recreation Commission to come up with implementation guidelines. They've been working fastidiously on that ever since. Um, they've had a number of meetings. They looked at implementation guidelines throughout the country, um, within the Bay Area, but also as far away as Florida and also Minnesota. They've come up with a method that they think is very 
particular to Brisbane. Um, the staff report covers all of the major aspects of it. Given the late hour, I'm not going to go through all of all of everything that's in the staff report or in the implementation guidelines. But I do want to point out that there is a idea of having a process for public publicly paid for art versus privately paid for art as two separate types of processes within the um, guidelines. Um, there is also the idea of the Public Art Advisory Committee. Um, this, the arts, this committee, and I'm looking to see if I have it in my staff report, if I have to go back into the guidelines itself. The Public Art Advisory Committee would be made up of two to three public uh, parks and recreation commissioners two council members, which we, which the Parks and Recreation Commission would imagine would be the Parks and Recreation Commission liaisons, and two Brisbane community members selected by the council who would serve for two terms. One would be professionally engaged in the art community, and one would be an employer or owner of a business located in Brisbane. Members of the Public Art Committee will be ineligible to propose for public art projects while they serve on the committee or for one year after they leave the committee. They wanted to make sure there wouldn't be seen as a conflict of interest. If somebody is an artist, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be suggesting their own piece of art to be commissioned. Um, they also wanted to make sure that there was an employee or an owner in a business located in Brisbane, because they wanted to make sure, since this is being funded by the businesses, um, that there would be representation of businesses on the public at art advisory committee. Um, specifically, if there was a piece of public art that would be selected, they would then suggest that you create a public art selection committee specifically for a piece of public art. Um, the committee would be also made up of nine members, at least one, but no more than two art professionals. And this would be artists, critics, or curators. And this they do not necessarily have to be within Brisbane. So what you'd be hoping for is that if you're going to commission and hope for to get a statue, you would have public, you'd have artists or curators who understand statuary, public statues. Um, if you're looking for, you know, as we did in the library, something more like a glass work that you'd have somebody more expert in that area. Um, you would also have a community member, again, a business owner or the representative, um, two to three members of the Park Commission, two members of the Council. Um, so that way what would happen is that if it's a piece of public art, the Public Art Selection Committee would choose, would recommend something to the Advisory Committee, the Advisory Committee would recommend it to the Commission, Commission would recommend it to the City Council. That way you would have a lot of ability for the public to have input. Um, one of the things that's important for the Parks and Recreation Commission and the subcommittee was that, you know, public art is just that. It's public. It's something that the community should understand is going in. It shouldn't be a surprise to them when it goes in. They should um, be able to participate in the selection process in some fashion. So those were the main points of how that would happen. There's more detail, obviously, in the implementation guidelines, and I apologize for not going through all of it in detail at the moment, but given the fact it's 11.15, I'm trying to do this quickly. Um, there's also one of the issues that they had talked about was how to use public art funds. And what they were anticipating was that um, 60, uh, no less than 65% of the money would be used for the purchase of art, the acquisition of art. 15% um, would be used for maintenance or curator curatorial services. The recognition that once you put in a piece of public art, that it doesn't just deteriorate, that you need to take care of it. So they want to have money set aside to take care of it. And then the other portion would be no more than 20% would be used for education purposes or project administration. They don't want to have the, you know, all the money going towards staff. They would like to have it be put mostly to the public art. Those are the main points in it. And I'm sorry, Kevin, if I have missed anything that you think is important, if I have. Would you like to come up, Kevin? And I know it's late, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, just to give an overview, this is the second part, the first part being the ordinance, which was passed in October of 2014, I believe. Uh, this is the, the, the implementation guidelines, is the, is the methods by which we go about 
um, selecting art when it comes up. Now, in the interim, of course, the public arts ordinance has been triggered, and that was with the with the the new library. And for that, we put together an ad hoc committee that served to make that decision in the interim. Uh, and so, so so far, we've actually have done two things uh, with the public with funding from the public arts. Um, uh, one is the is the uh, installation that will go into the library, and the other is the is uh, uh, putting twenty thousand dollars aside for restoring the mural on uh, on the uh, on the store. Uh, I did just want to make clear because in the in in reviewing this for tonight, the staff report um, uh, the last paragraph before fiscal input fiscal input says sixty five percent, fifteen percent, and twenty percent. When Stewart presented it, he he changed it uh, as it is changed in the ordinance. This was one of the last changes that allows us to uh, to to move those numbers around with no less than 65 percent going uh, to the artist uh, and no more than 20 percent and no more than 15 percent. So, for example, if we were to put in a statue that is made of steel and that is not going to have any maintenance aspects to it, then then we could decide at that point to only allot five percent for maintenance of that and add the extra ten percent towards the commission. So, so there's a little flexibility in those percentages that, uh, while Stuart in his presentation did uh, allude to, it, it uh, uh, doesn't co um, correspond with the staff report, but it is in the in the implementation guidelines. So that's all. Thank you, Kevin. So I have a question for you. So you said that if the cost of the maintenance were less than, where would that money go? Well, what, so, so it all bag? has to add up to 100%. Not less than 65% goes to the artist, but depending on the project, we might say we want 75% to go to the artist, and we, because of the okay. nature of the, but a mural, for example, on the other uh, side of the equation, and we had a lot of conversations about murals, and we're about to, to look into restoring a mural, that right up front, we might want to put the full 15% aside for ongoing maintenance for, for the mural project. So depending on what it is, that gives us some flexibility. The other aspect, the 20%, that has to do with staff, you know, how much staff time is put into it. If it's relatively easy, maybe we only put 15, project to project, maybe we only put 15% into staff. So there's some flexibility about where those funds go, and that is reflected in the ordinance. That was one of the last uh, changes that we made due to input from the public. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah great. Thank you, Kevin. That's great. Any questions? No. No. I think uh, with the with the Park and Rec Commission and their, you know, their Motion to approve par yeah, public awesome. arts implementation guidelines. Second. Second. I just like try and get in there and get those motion because it's oh, late he's trying to move it along well, you, you so, talk too long Cliff. second <laughs> so does anyone have any questions no okay i have a question or i guess a comment um so in let's see in the guidelines on page two the bullet that is um second from the bottom public art advisory committee um and you talked about this Stuart, um in the staff report that it says members of the public art committee will be ineligible to propose for public art projects while they serve on the committee or for one year after they leave the committee. It, the wording on that seemed, I knew what you were trying to say, but I think um, it would be helpful to clarify it to perhaps say um, ineligible to propose for public art their own projects or ones in which they have a financial interest. Um, something along those lines, because it just made it sound like they couldn't propose projects, but it didn't say that those were their own projects, or ones they had a financial stake in. So that was my only comment. And is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this? Okay. Um, thank you, Kevin. I'm very pleased to see this finally coming to fruition. I, I, I worked on the, the public art, um, piece early on as well as for the library and um, I'm glad to see the implementation guidelines finally getting before us and with such detail and care. Appreciate that. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
next one. Thank you. Okay. And with that change, with my minor change, okay. Um, item D. A. Sorry. A. That's right. We skipped. Crossed off the wrong one. Um, before. Um, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So before I get into that, just um, in terms of items that we still need to do tonight under uh, Mayor and Council, um, item B. Um, we, we have the letter here for you, and um, before you leave tonight, I know it's late, uh, if you could come over to um, Ingrid and, uh, and sign it, and we'll get it off tomorrow morning. Um, okay. With regards to item uh, A, this is a um, item um, uh, proposing a resolution calling for an election to establish a gross receipts tax or a $200,000 minimum tax, whichever is greater on soils recycling establishments. As the Council is aware, Currently, we charge a truck haul fee um, on um, the uh, soils processing uh, business. Um, the City Council has reviewed that uh, earlier this year, and your infrastructure uh, subcommittee has had uh, three meetings. Uh, we've also met with the uh, primary business that would be impacted by this. Um, staff came up with a recommendation to convert this to a uh, um, gross receipts tax um, um, as opposed to the truck haul uh, fee. Um, we can get into that if you'd, if you'd like, um, but um, important to note uh, that the um, uh, subcommittee did meet last night. Um, they raised concerns with regards to the issue of the um, use permit, which will be coming up before the Planning Commission in October, um, and are recommending that we delay action on this until after the uh, Planning Commission and then ultimately the City Council decide on the um, on the use permit. Um, given the late hour, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I think that was a good synopsis of that. I have some questions okay. if I may. So, um, Clay, during our, um, we had a, a closed session meeting, I guess last month, or maybe it was two months ago, in regards to um, you know, looking at uh, establishing a business license tax in regards to the soil processing. And, um, uh, you know, my recollection of that, that meeting was that um, the council had agreed to, to move forward with it and um, that then we had assigned the subcommittee to find out what would be an appropriate percentage. I, I, am I correct on that uh, yeah the, the only point I, I don't believe it was a closed meeting because this would not be subject to a closed meeting I, I thought we had a meeting it was in the <laughs> well, I thought <laughs> we, we did have a closed session I, uh, item concerning um, because there was a question that came up about the uh, the imposition or the continued imposition of the um, the truck hauling fees versus uh, the imposition of That's a right. tax. So that was sort of the under the umbrella in which we had the closed session. Um, and then coming out of that, my recollection is that the, that the council, you know, asked the committee to go back and, and look at something, and that's kind of where we are tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, you know, in the staff report, it says that uh, to do any tax increase, um, you know, subject to the approval of the majority of the, the voters, it has to be during um, a, um, an election where the city council is being voted in. So it, either we did it in November of 2017 or we'd have to do it in 2019. So we'd have to wait two years. Yeah, I think with one exception, I'll let the city attorney correct me if I got this wrong, but I mean, I do believe you could put it to the voters at another election, but it would require a two-thirds vote at that point. Mm. No, the, the uh, as a special tax, it, it could be done uh, at a at a different election Higher with a so. uh, with a two thirds vote. That yeah. is correct. Yeah. Okay. And then um, currently, right now, we're we're collecting about six hundred thousand dollars in truck haul fees. Yes. Okay. And then, uh, if we move forward with uh, this uh, ballot measure in the, in the in the public approved it uh, in the staff report you're, you're anticipating an increase of somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 from what currently is being 
generated from trickle fees. Yeah, and another way of looking at it is that the, the current fee generates around 12 to 13 percent mm -hmm. of gross receipts. It's not applied that way, but that's what it's the equivalent is. So depending on how fast you ratchet it up to the 20 percent, at the full 20 percent, we would anticipate based on the current activity, um, the gross volume of the business that would be in that neighborhood of, um, of additional revenue. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to say it. I mean, just based upon what we've talked about before and, and um, the use that's currently out there and the impacts that it has, um, you know, I think having additional um, money for that type of use makes sense. And I think we should put it before the voters. I mean, I think that's that was really the, I think, the direction that the full council gave to the subcommittee. And, um, you know, I, I would make a motion to, you know, adopt resolution number 2017-26, uh, calling for a consolidated election on November 7th, 2017, for the voters to consider approving business license tax on soil recycling establishments. So, um, I, I've been in on these subcommittee meetings, and and well, Clark and I both agreed that um, we want to maximize as much revenue as we could from UPC, and that we don't see it as a um, attractive business. It's an attractive nuisance, is what it is, and that we see it as a revenue source at this time. We did have a bit of a difference of opinion when it came down to um, my opinion was that by not having a current um, permit in effect, we're working on a temporary um, memorandum of understanding, um, that this would appear in the public's eyes to be a yes or no on continuing to have the soils processing out there. And it would be very confusing and would muddy the water, so to speak, or the air, um, before we have um, a direction from the council and the planning commission on what and how long that use is going to be out there. And while this looks like it could um, generate quite a bit more money, it also has a threshold of 200,000, um, a minimum threshold, which would be less than what we're currently getting. And it would be based on a sliding fee, an up to fee, where we would implement that over time and ratchet it up to where that maximum fee might be and without knowing how long the um, use would be allowed that it was giving a different perception of of what the fee and what the ballot measure would be and due to the late hour i'm probably not describing it really well but i couldn't bring it forward and and so Clark and I agreed that with the, for my opinion, when the reset, when the storage tanks, the liquid tank went into, um, to the ballot, it wasn't a matter of get rid of the tank farm or increase the fees. And it passed at 77 or 79 percent because the public agreed that, you know, it's there, we might as well get the money for it. But this is going to make, it looks to me, that this is saying, do you want this business and tax it, or do you not want the business? And that's not the decision we're making. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we, we already had this discussion. You, you've already given us your opinion before, and when we had that meeting. I look at it the same way. I don't yeah. see this use lasting forever, but when, you know, but since it's, it's there, um, we should try and get the most money and, and that's what we ag ag agreed to eventually we're going to make a decision on the valence and I think that the concerns that you have regarding the current 
truck haul fees and and, and not having a, a you know those clear, clear guidance or guidelines, we'll we'll get that also through this. Okay. Well, so this was a Clark. I mean, I'm surprised that because you were in favor of it before, and now uh, Cliff. Let, let, uh, okay, I'll, I'll say my piece now if you want. If yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that. <clears throat> I was, and I was in favor of it last night. I was willing to move forward. Uh, the points that Terry brought up is that, uh, and you know, we did have one member of the public there who, who also thought that uh, uh, it might be confusing to citizens that uh, um, we bring this ordinance forward, um, that they think that we're really in favor of a long-term use because we don't have something in the use permit that's in place. It's going to go before the planning commission, I think, in October is what we talked about. And so Terry and I were split on that, and I didn't want to bring it forward being split because I didn't want to spend a long time explaining it, and here we are. Well, actually, I mean, here you know, we it here we are, eleven thirty at night, and so know, now yeah, we're, so we're, we're there. Like when we talked about it before, it was yeah. it seemed like it was four four council members were for it, and and, and you were against it. Now maybe things have changed. I but, I well, could I could just as well vote for it, but I, I you know uh, I mean I want to hear I, from I, I, Madison I, I, and I don't think that the, now the, we're here. the public is going to be. I, I mean I, I I put more faith in the intelligence of the community to. To understand the issue, I don't. I don't see it being a, a confusing thing. And if we feel like we need to educate the community on on that this isn't, you know, a a, a long term vision for the site. It's just this is what the current use is, um, and, and you know, in the interim, we should apply this um, this business license tax to get get the most money for that impact that. Is a significant impact on our community. Yeah. Through through the chair, just I don't know if this will make any difference or not, but in order for this to go on the ballot, it it'll take uh, four votes of the council. Huh. It's That's a two thirds enough. it's a two thirds kind of thing <laughs> to put it on the ballot on a tax measure. So it's going to take four of you to uh, to move this forward. Hmm. Interesting. So <laughs> I have a question. Can I ask a question first, Madison? Absolutely. Okay. So. Um, Michael, can you explain to us what the difference is in terms of like what um, controls we would be able to have in place with an interim use permit as opposed to a memorandum of understanding? Um, because in the email that we got uh, from Clay uh, yesterday or today, earlier, whenever it was, it, it sounded like it would be the same sorts of quality control over the dirt that's being imported and exported as well as pile heights. Um, and that will also address hours of operations and other general operating procedures. So what's the difference between the interim, the IUP and the, um, you know, and the MOU, really? Well, it, it, I guess fundamentally it assumes that the, um, that the council ultimately <coughs> will approve an interim use permit. <coughs> uh, but I think substantively, assuming the council does, it, it probably isn't a whole lot different. Again, depending on what the terms and conditions of the MOU are and what the conditions of approval that the council would put on an interim use permit could be more, more onerous, could be less onerous, but essentially if the use is going to be permitted even on an interim basis, uh, those conditions can be as what the council comes up with and they could be similar or more strenuous than what the MOU currently provides. Okay. Madison? So from just to have clarity from the subcommittee, um, it, you just on the flip side just wouldn't put it on the ballot? Is that, that the option that you're suggesting? My, my thought was that if we had a permit, and it, it's, uh, it's a temporary permit at best, when we do renew the permit, a maximum of five years, and that we should have that in place where we have know what we're intending the use to be so that we 
have a timeline. We know what the height piles, pile height is, what the uses are going to be, what those things are, and that we're not granting the use to get the money from the tax. I think we're putting the cart before the horse by not having the use permit in place prior to the tax. Um, and I think that while it would be, could be convenient to have it, um, the lower threshold of the tax, uh, the voting, because we have it during a council election, because we have the election during a council, um, that it would still, if it's a benefit to the community, I think we could get the required vote in a non-election year that would, we would need to pass it, just like we did with the tank storage fee. So I don't, and that this also does not address the concrete recycling. This fee doesn't impact the concrete recycling because we didn't have enough information on their business model and how much it would, if it would change and make us get more or less money. So we just excluded them. And I really felt that it would be good for both of those types of industrial uses to have a fee changed at the same time. So that was the other reason. So no, I would not bring it forward now would not support it now see you know and I said well we could lay out the argument in the you know argument in favor for on why we're doing it and but I said okay well since we're kind of split I don't want to come with a recommendation but okay, yeah yeah but Rhea, you're willing to move forward, so am I. Yeah. I'm willing I to move forward. forward last I mean, I, I feel like Cliff pointed out in the beginning that the difference in tax revenue is significant um, if we don't move forward now versus in two years from now. Um, and I, I, I see that even if we have the tax structure set up, it still doesn't prevent the Planning Commission and the Council from, you know, having a f full discussion of the interim use permit and um, I think it just clarifies um, you know what the what we would think the requirements should be so I don't have a problem with moving forward I think fiscally it makes the most sense you know I have a quick question I mean so all of those you know those guidelines that we'd want to have in place that, that that Terry just you know mentioned I mean we as a council you know working with our Planning Commission can Put those in place prior to implementing the the tax after if it was approved by the voters correct i mean we would work on those guidelines and 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 then have that in in place uh before we finalized on the uh the wording of the of the tax well, all right I'm, if you're asking once the voters approve it if <coughs> the the tax would be in place and be up to the council to decide how much of the tax, if any, was going to be imposed in any given calendar year. So if your question is that you that until the guidelines were or the use permit was in place, that maybe the tax wouldn't go up higher than what is currently being received from the hall fees, the answer could be yes if that was the council's direction. Okay. So, I mean, what I'm getting at is that, that you, you, if you move forward with the tax, that doesn't mean that you, you can't then do these things. That's what I'm saying. You know, I mean, I, I don't, yeah. I mean, everything that, you, that you've that you just talked about, you can you can work on and also pass this tax. So, I, you know, your, your argument just isn't, isn't meshing. I'm sorry, it's 1140 at night, and my argument is not going to mess with it. Let's just take the vote and Ma make the decision. Madison hasn't had a chance to... Voice so if it didn't go on this election, would it be June election or it has to be? No, it could be. Couldn't it be on another election? Just would have to get 66 percent of the voters, correct? The next election would be June, I believe, of 2018. So we would have six months extra time to work on all of the things to just get all the ducks in the row. So it's all very clear. We wouldn't have to wait two years. 
But it would be the only item on the agenda uh, on that it election. Would be, it would but, be, be, but again, it's a special tax at that point, so you would have to allocate, you would have to put on the ballot or as part of the tax measure what the tax would be used for. This tax is a general revenue tax, can be used for anything. The special tax, by definition, has to be used for a specific purpose. And it would cost the city more to hold that election. And that is true. But we could designate that it went to capital projects, or we could designate it went to sewer infrastructure, or. And it would cost about probably. Would like it require $40, two thirds votes? Mm -hmm. What does it well, re require this now? It requires 50%. Plus and if we put it in June, you'd have to be a special tax and requires two-thirds votes, right? Okay. And the cost of the election. All right. Well, here's the thing. I hate that dirt pile. I hate it with every fiber of my being. And I don't think I'm willing to wait. I think I'm ready to get that money right now. So I hear where you're coming from, Terry, and... It makes sense to me, but I also trust in our voters, and I think that I trust them to understand what we're trying to do. You know, it's not the greatest of circumstances. I wish it was different. I wish, you know, we weren't essentially putting the cart before the horse, but I think that it, it, the benefits don't outweigh the costs to wait. I think it becomes more complicated, and I think it's just easier to just bang it out right now. So... I'm willing to to put it on the November election. Okay, great. Second. I all right. Before we, I do have a slip. Um, Tony Barrios. I second Ed Cliff's motion. Okay. Thank you. This is the item that I came down to talk about tonight, and I didn't expect it to be holding everybody this late. Um, that speaks to the aggressiveness of the agenda. Um, I'm not going to go on. There's a lot I've got to say about this, and tonight is too late to say it. I don't think it's fair to you or anybody who's still up at home. But I'm very disappointed with the lack of transparency in the way this whole operation has been handled since, I guess, 1980 or whenever it began. Uh, I, I came into possession just, I think, yesterday of a copy of a letter that Dana Dilworth had sent to the council about this where she noted it was 30 years of operation. And so that spans many council's uh, terms. And during that time, I find it really objectionable that, that the operation was permitted at all without doing either an environmental impact report or very stringent testing, both on the materials that come into Brisbane as well as the air quality monitoring around the site and in the rest of town. I understand that the quarry is not within our control. The county permits that, and I'm not sure whether or not we can still, that, that does not preclude us from doing testing around that facility as well. But I think all of Brisbane's residents deserve a much higher level of protection in terms of <coughs> checking in advance that we're not polluting our air and killing ourselves. There's no way that any of us would know, and I'm not being alarmist at all, there's no way any of us would know if we were breathing in microscopic particles because nobody else knew it that died from it already. And further, um, even though you, you council members are aware of these items, there isn't much outreach on the city's website or any other means that would alert the rest of the population if they had any interest. And I know a lot of them do because we were talking about it on Facebook <coughs> uh, for the past couple of days. And that's where I received my first copy of the memo of uh, authority or memorandum of understanding. Yeah, well, it wasn't MOU, it was MOA, I forget what, it, memo of authorization maybe. And when I reviewed that, which is hard in two days, because this has been a very, very busy two days for me, I saw a lot of things in there that were objectionable and questionable, like the individual height limits for each one of these piles, and only one pile is required to be hydro seated. And um, so there's a number of issues about that. It also mentions specifically uh, mean sea level, <clears throat> maximum elevation heights above mean sea level. 
Now, do any of you know what that means? I don't know if any of you know what that means. But my impression is that Tunnel Road is a little bit higher than the bay. And I guess that would be mean sea level. So that would suggest to me that those piles <clears throat> are um, actually higher than maybe somebody might think they are. And, and I'd like to know that the people who are being hired to measure those piles and provide the city staff with those measurements have some checks on them so that you know that it's uh, verifiable, reliable information that you're receiving, that they haven't already exceeded these height limits. I, I drive down from today, after taking my wife home, I drove down Bay Shore, and when you look to the left, you look to the east, you see the tank farm, and the dirt piles exceed the height of those tanks substantially. You cannot see the bay anymore from, from that perspective, and that bothers the hell out of me. Uh, I don't see anything where there's any discussion about reducing these levels, and when Council Member Lentz mentioned, you know, keeps saying, well, it's temporary or it's interim. You know, 30 years is a freaking lifetime for a lot of people. And I don't look at that as temporary. And Webster's Dictionary doesn't, and Black's Law Dictionary doesn't either. So interim certainly can be a thousand years. But that's a pretty permanent operation out there. And I'm fed up with it. Um, when Madison said she hates it, well, I think a lot of people in town are, are not very happy with it, but I'm concerned with it not because of its crappy appearance, which is obvious, but because of the potential health risks. I'd like to have testing done that advises us that we're safe, and then I'd like to do what Madison is saying is charge the heck out of them. I don't think that the, uh, you know, I wish I had been aware to participate in some of those subcommittee meetings, but I didn't even know they were being taking place. And I don't think that this particular fee structure or this tax structure that's proposed for you uh, right now is necessarily the right one. I don't think it's high enough necessarily. And I, and I don't know that if you were to pass this tonight and it went into effect tomorrow, I know it won't be, but <laughs> But as soon as it goes into effect, do you think that that operation is not going to then raise those fees on all those truckers? And I think you should set up your ordinance so that you capture any increase in those fees that they're, that they're going to pass on. Uh, I don't think it does that now. If I'm wrong, I'd be happy to be advised of that. But I'd like to, I'd like to know. And, um, and finally, the concrete thing. I, it, it, the, the term, the, the name that I saw in the memo was SunQuest Properties, Inc. And I keep hearing that that's a subsidiary or a, 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 another part of Universal Paragon Corporation. And if it is, let's, tie, let's connect the dots, is I had heard at some point that the concrete operation, concrete recycling operation was a separate company from the dirt soils operation. But if it's also another um, corporation that UPC owns, then, you know, I don't see doing part of the beast and not the whole beast. Do it all. Do it all at the same time and do it fairly, but get the most that the city can get. Nobody's going to have a problem voting for more money for Brisbane, and everybody will vote for that. Um, but my concern is that we don't sell out to anybody, regardless of who owns it or who runs it, until we know that it's a safe health, safe from the health perspective, and with the mayor's sensitivities to that, smoking and lung cancer and whatnot, I would think that you'd be leading the charge on that. So hopefully you will soon, uh, because nobody but me that I know of and a couple other people like Dana have been uh, previously, at least not, not so vociferously, I know... Um, Former Mayor Ray Miller is concerned about it, but that's my that's my bit. Thank, Thank you, you, Tony. Yeah, so, we're, we're all concerned about it, Tony. I mean, there's no question about it. Is this, a, you know, uh, that's what caused this whole thing to do that memorandum, you know, because we didn't have the uh, interim use permit had expired, but there was a lot of things that went on there that the city didn't like that. We found out about 
it caused uh, that memorandum and to do these checks and balances of, of the soil coming in that's clean and it has to go out clean because then it's checked, you know. So <clears throat> mean sea level, is, Hold on. we got high tide and low tide. Sorry, Tony, we do have other speakers. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. very sea level. I just, wanted, I just wanted to respond to that. No, no, This no. isn't a discussion. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm just telling you what 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 the what the history is, and mean sea level is you got high tide and low tide. Mean is in the middle, that goes and that's taken from a laser measurement that was supposed to do that. Uh, um, uh, Randy Bro and his staff has been working on, and a couple times they have shut them down out there. And so yeah, it's not a perfect thing, and it's not a business that we want permanently, at all. I doubt. I don't think anybody here knows, yeah. you know, so it, it's, you know, I mean, we're in agreement there. And, you know, the point was, is with the subcommittee is Terry wanted to get these things in place, the interim use permit. And, and I said, okay, well, we're kind of split. I, I'm okay with going forward with it, but if we're not in unison, I don't want to make a recommendation because I, we got a long agenda and I don't want to be here in the late hour, which it's almost midnight now. So now here we are and I'm ready to vote on it now. And, okay, and move so forward. we do have one more public comment. Yeah, Andrew. okay. But they give you a few answers to, to your questions. So. Thank you, Clark. Greg? I'll try to keep this 90 seconds. Last time the soils processing came up in the Planning Commission, my understanding from staff was that we have limits on the height, but there was no particular temporal limits, which is to say that the applicant was free to continue operating until they submitted an application for something else or something changed from the council. Now, it's late, and uh, I may have misunderstood the nuance of the MOU, but the understanding I got was that it was a little vague. So I would just like to emphasize that in my mind, if you can go from something vague to something more concrete, I think it would be better to do that sooner rather than later. And while this is open, my let's try to be guys. very defined about what the terms are in terms of if they're going to be continued to et cetera, yes. and you know. Thank you. Yeah, we I just think we want to get rid of those dirt piles really just, and I'm okay. tired of the wolf guarding the hen. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Okay, Council Member O'Connell opposed. So the motion passes four to one. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item F. Consider approval of memorandum of understanding between the City of Brisbane and Jefferson Union High School District to fund school bus service for fiscal year 2017-18. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any need for a staff report? No? No. Okay. Any public comment? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. So now we're moving on to staff reports. City Manager's report on upcoming activities. About a 20 minute report. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I'll, I'll decline tonight. Okay. Mayor and Council member, matters. Schedule interviews for Commission and Committee vacancies. Can we do this via doodle poll as well as Council meeting schedule? Thank you. And can I make a comment on, on this? Um, it appears that. Um, we have three applicants for the Planning Commission, but I understand that Kathy Wall, in talking to her, is not applying for Planning Commission, that she was applying for Park and Recreation. And yep. I think that should be noted in the, in the interviews. Okay. Okay. Uh, but confirm with, with Kathy Wall, but when I asked and her about it, she said she didn't know that she had been applied for that. That's good to know. And just so you know, I checked my calendar and September 11th is the one date. Well, September 18th works, but not as good. So I, doodle poll. I'll do it by doodle. Send a doodle poll. Um, okay. Item B. City Council response to Metropolitan Transportation Commission Association of Bay Area Governments consideration of adoption of Plan Bay Area 2040. Everybody send a letter. If you could just <laughs> make sure you sign it before you leave tonight. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sign that. Okay. Item C: Countywide assignments, subcommittee reports. No. None. 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 Okay. 
City Council schedule, meeting schedule. Okay. So we'll be meeting the second and fourth Thursdays of October as opposed to the first Microphone's and third. Not on. Why are oh. we? Uh, why we're trying to schedule Parkside. They're not available on October 5th. Madison's not available on October 19th. So the 12th will work for them. Um, and then the other item we want to bring forward is the capital improvement program. So I plan on bringing that on the 26th. I mean, if, it, if it's really difficult, I mean, I can just not be at that meeting. So... If, well, you wanted to be at the Parkside one, though. I mean, yeah, I would like yeah. to be, but, you know, I'm not yeah. going to make everyone um, adjust. Be there. We'll, we'll accommodate. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. if, if, if somebody has a problem with that, let me know. We'll, we'll with these work with here. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Written communications. Day by day, not <laughs> so I want to note for the record we received the following non Bayland's related written correspondence between June 1st and July 20th from Dana Dilworth on July 20th, Michelle Salmon on July 20th, Michelle Dezitzer on July 19th, Jenny Citiarelli on July 10th. Uh, we have an email address, share, share, S H E R G I A S at AOL.com on June 25th, and Tony Varios on June 23rd. Um, oral communications number two. Um, anyone would like to speak? No? And I did want to note, I forgot to mention it earlier, um, I was asked that we could close in memory of Danny Lee, um, who passed away tragically. Um, after having a heart attack over the weekend. He's the father of a Lippman student who lost her mother uh, this past year from a car accident. So our thoughts are with the family. And there's an online fundraiser um, to benefit um, her, his daughter with generosity.com. And uh, you can contact the city if you'd like more information. So um, make a that, motion to. Is there a motion to adjourn? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.